Welcome to the DSO or Digital Storage Scope class. The DSO or Lab Scope is a powerful diagnostic tool. Now many technicians use it in everyday use, while other technicians use it when they have no other piece of equipment that will do the job. Then there are those who don't have a storage scope or don't know how to use the one they have. This class is specifically designed to cover all of these technicians. Experienced DSO users are going to discover new ways to get maximum use out of their DSOs. Casual users are going to advance their skills and first time users are going to see what they're missing and how it would fit into an overall diagnostic program before purchasing a DSO. Now the DSO isn't a magical tool that replaces all other diagnostic equipment. Just the opposite. It must be used along with scan tools, gas analyzers, where it can fill the gaps left over when you're searching for answers. In this class, we'll discover why you want to use a DSO. The choice is yours. Let's take a minute to talk about the differences between a lab scope, a DSO, and a grafting multimeter. Lab scope is an earlier version that used the raster type tube, the, floor, the phosphorus tube like a television. Digital storage scopes gave us more of a computer display, LCD readouts, colored screens. And the grafting multimeter fills a very good gap. It has a waveform display very much like a digital storage scope, while not quite as powerful. But it has something that is very useful. It can graft things like duty cycle frequency, injector pulse width, and things that will show us changes that are too sudden that we might miss on a digital storage scope. In this particular presentation, we're going to be using the waveform display. And we talk about displaying things. We're going to talk about how we're going to have sampling rates, the memory depth, the bandwidths, the triggers. Triggering can be difficult, so number of channels. There are those who would spend a great deal of time learning about all the technical information about a given product before making a purchase. Then there are those who just want to have take the time to buy a brand name or whatever. Here at the research center, when we look at equipment that includes DSOs, we look specifically for stuff that's engineered for the automotive field. There's some very important reasons for this. We want adapters and stuff to look at secondary ignition because we're going to take the time to do a lab scope. We're going to get full use out of it. Now some of those things you're going to have to be looking at is the update rate of the display. A low resolution screen will not allow a fast enough signal to display correctly. There'll be information that the machine has gathered you will not see. Some scopes have these faster hamper rates, and what we found we had to do is we had to record the information and play it back and step through it to see all the information. Now, display resolution is very important. The display is divided into a series of small dots called pixels. The number of pixels on the screen is important because if, it does, if you don't have enough pixels, you will not accurately draw waveforms on the display. A good example of this is a primary ignition signal that's very fast with spikes. These spikes will tend to disappear or be jumping around if you have low resolution. When in fact they are steady, they are not causing a problem. You need to understand the capabilities of your equipment and we're going to be showing you as we go through this program examples of all these things. You're going to see it live. When we decided to make measurements, the measurement techniques with a scope, if you're going to absolutely positively accurately measure voltage or current or time, you're going to have to use cursors and statistical data. That's all built into your lab scope so you can utilize that without going to extreme difficulties. But most important, let's talk about what we like best about using a DSO. We want to stop fast moving signals to study it. As Doc Nall says, he wants to see the signal at the speed his brain moves, not at the speed the computer moves. And that's a very accurate statement. We need to study this signal over time. One of the most important is we're looking for intermittent. Are we losing pulses? We've solved some really difficult problems because we slowed the pulse down, looked at the whole pulse strain and said, oh, there's pulses that are dropping out on occasion. We want to look at the signals the OBD2 monitor sees to do things like catalytic converter efficiency, no two actions, and the magnetic pickup signals. These are the signals we can study. Look at the same things computer does. And it's important to us to do that. Let's go look at one of these signals. Let's look at the amplitude 
and spacing over time of this signal. What we're doing when we view any given signal is we're looking at the signal's data values, its amplitude, and its switching. The answers to some diagnostic questions about the signal's amplitude, when is it high, when is it low, this gives us a behavior of a certain amount of time, and these questions will give us a diagnostic direction. The diagnostic direction is important. It will tell you where to go next, but to understand how to get to diagnostic direction, you must be understand what we're looking at. Now we're looking at a communication signal. This is a signal used with network communications. We must see times when the signal remains low on this particular communications protocol. This signal must be here, must be followed by a longer high pulse. Those two pulses are very critical for the communications to work. The network would stop communicating if this long low pulse is not here. If it's missing, communications will be down, hook your scan tool up, hook whatever, no communications, you ping with your scan tool, unable to ping, status is, is it's not working, it's off. None of those tell you that this pulse is missing. Now we talk about a diagnostic direction. When we see this pulse missing, we have a module on the bus that's talking continuously and never going silent. Once that happens, no other module ever attempts to talk. What happens in communications? And remember, in this website, there is 20 years of communications, including new CAM. So we'll give you all the protocols for the past 20 years to show you details like this. How else could you find this kind of information? We would know where to go diagnostically if we saw this signal. That is the most important statement we can possibly make. If we define a DSO in a grafting multimeter, it's an electrical measuring device that displays the amplitude of electrical signal as it changes over time. It's in a waveform or graph format. Now we can call them graphs, we can call them traces, we can call them patterns, we can call them waveforms. What do you want to call them? They all mean the same thing. We're going to look at this pattern. Let's talk about the characteristics of this pattern. Like a voltmeter, we have to set this up. When using a DSO, you must consider the voltage scale, which is also considered the gain. This example shows we have a 10 volt scale. Most scopes have a scale on the, on the side of the screen as well. Over here, the voltage scale is pointing to 6 volts. We have a signal that's between 6 and 7 volts, which means we have to be on a 10 volt scale for this particular application. We could be on a 20, we'd make it smaller. But just like a voltmeter, we could not be on a low scale or would not be able to read the values. That's the point we're making in this particular case. Now not only are we measuring voltage, we're measuring time. How much time? We're looking at milliseconds. We have 10 milliseconds full screen, 1 millisecond per division. This is the sweep rate and we are going to talk about the importance of looking at a complete pulse train like we're looking at now. We already gave you a clue about this because if we don't slow this down, we can't see that low spot. And remember, we're looking for a long period of low signal to voltage to see if this communication signal is working properly. We need enough signals on the screen to be able to see this pulse train. That is so very important. All too often, we see people trying to look at individual pulses. And that's all well and fine. But it's not going to find intermittent problems when you do that. Remember, it's all about the signal. We're looking for this long low. There's a lot of information on this screen, but the waveform is what we're talking about now. You need to decide if this signal is normal. If the signal is wrong, you need to get a diagnostic direction from the display. This is a communication signal. If you did not have this long period, we're not going to talk. Remember, you've got a communication with all these waveforms. In this class, you're going to learn the theory of operation, and we're going to show you where technicians sometimes make mistakes in setting up the DSO. We have found these real world issues on how to get set up. The instruction manual simply don't have the information available. But let's get back to getting a diagnostic direction. We've talked about that. How do you get a diagnostic direction? We want you to understand this because we don't want you to get lost in sweep rates and voltages and triggering and slopes before you understand something. Every waveform represents the measurements the scope is making. The purpose of using a scope is to get a waveform that can be studied 
or diagnostic value. And the reason for studying it is to get a diagnostic direction. Now let's talk about that. If this particular signal was not here, we had a problem with it. Where would it take us? What would we do? Well, we slowed it down so we can see a whole train of pulses. And when we slowed it down, we see that we have our pulse that's going low. But let's look more detail. Does the signal go high? We can see the signal high, and without cursors, we can't tell you exactly what it is. It's somewhere near 7 volts. We can talk about cursors later because we'll use that to measure exact voltages. But let's talk about the differences in high and low. The high pulse is when it's over, above midpoint. The low pulse is when it's below midpoint. Minor distortions in the high side or low side will not cause irregularity. It will still read and operate normally. This is designed for this. Be careful when you set this up. If we had a signal that went all the way to the top of the range, like in this case we're pointing to the 10 volts on the left over there, if the signal goes all the way to the top of the range, check for an overrange condition. Now at the bottom right, we've captured an overrange condition. That little red square there at the top of the voltage scale saying, hey, you're overrange. You think you're reading 10 volts, but you may be reading 12, 14, 16, 18. We don't know what you're reading. So be aware that you have to get the right voltage range. It's no different than using a voltmeter, like we said before. And we've talked about the signal. The signal is low just before it goes high. That's important to us. Time. It's there in time. It's well into. We started this trace. We're five, over five milliseconds into it. It goes low. At about five and a half milliseconds, it goes back high. We're looking at this particular mode. As we learn about the signals we're looking at by studying information, we learn that we can get a diagnostic direction. We're not just looking for a bunch of pulses and saying, that's done. If we can qualify that this is working normally at the input to a module, if we have the absolute normal signal that's supposed to be to the input of a communications module, we check power and ground. Is there B plus there? Do we have a good ground? And don't think that's just talk. Time and time again, we've had situations where people said, yeah, I can't communicate. I'm going to change the module. Check the ground. Check the B plus first. And we found problems after they swapped the module. Hey, I swapped the module. Your program didn't work. We come out and we say, okay, what was B plus and what was ground? Uh, didn't check it. Let's go check it. Oh, you got a bad ground. You got a missing fuse. Check the basics. But if we have this signal at the input, to a module and the module has proper power and proper ground and it doesn't function change it that is a true diagnostic the diagnostic direction was the signal was normal go to the module if the signal is abnormal find out why it's abnormal where's the abnormality coming from so let me say this again we have a diagnostic situation we've got a, a code we've got a status symbol we've got a ping something telling us we cannot communicate with module XYZ we go to module XYZ. We go right to the input. We find the normal signal that's identical to what's on the rest of the bus. If you really want to know about this in detail, go to the communications. But look at our diagnostic directions. We've got an absolute normal signal at the input. We check B plus and ground of that module. You have two choices after that. Try a flash program of that module if it applies or replace the module if it doesn't. Now you've got to do a lot more diagnostics than the new car dealer because They've got the world's best diagnostics. They've got a parts department full of new module. They can stick a new module on and see if it fixes it. If it doesn't, then they can go check power and ground. You, on the other hand, need to fix it and identify it. So keep in mind, time is of important value. We talked about time making a difference in this signal. And we talked about the amplitude making a difference. Is low, low enough? Is high, high enough? The vertical scale is used to measure amplitude. It can be amplitude of volts or amps if we use the low amps probe. This allows us to see what the voltage is doing. In this case, we are seeing a voltage we measured to be 7.56 volts. We measured the low to be 0 0.035 volts. All of this gives us information we simply couldn't find anywhere. Round it off to 7.8 volts, it's close enough. We don't have to worry too much about this. We're looking for signals between 7 and 8 volts. Here's what happens. The high and low in this signal is determined by when it passes a midpoint region. Somewhere in this case around 3.9 volts. As it goes above 3.9, it's high. As it goes below 3.9, it's low. If there are slight distortions in the top or the bottom, 
it will not affect the signal. We see that a lot on Ford. On the crank and pip, there are some distortions in the top, but it works perfectly fine. It doesn't hurt at all. So know what you're looking for. That's why we have all the other diagnostic training. It's part of how to use this lab scope. We're looking here at this 0 0.009 volts, 9 millivolts. We've got the overall picture by using time and voltage. The basic premise is watch the signal over time. We've said it before. We're going to say it again. It must perform as we expect it to perform. So utilize the dimensions, left, right, up, and down. We've got the start of time, end of time, time moving across to the right, voltage or amperage moving up and down the scale. This is what gives it a difference over looking at a standard multimeter or another appliance that's going to be measuring something. We could not take a multimeter or a frequency meter and measure the signal. Why? Because we have pulses that are wide and narrow and that would not show up accurately in a frequency meter. So what we have here is a signal that we can only evaluate by looking at voltage, amplitude, and time. And by knowing that, we can tell you if it's a good or bad signal. And there's no other way to get here. So stop and think about the basics here. The whole purpose of this introduction was to take you through concept of time going horizontally and amplitude of the signal, either amps or volts, going up and down. If you've got that part, you have this portion of the program well under control.